and church family. Good to see you, and welcome to those out on the patio and those worshiping online. Um, um, would you join me in prayer before we start into today's message? Father, uh, your word says to um, grieve with those who grieve. Um, and Lord, uh, many of us are grieving today the loss of two key members. Um, and um, Lord, so many people are going through difficult and challenging circumstances right now. And, and so, Father, we seek you, and uh, we seek to walk with them and to shoulder these burdens um, together. Uh, Father, we know that we can't fix the hard things in life, but we know that the burden is lighter when we carry it together. And so, Father, for the Sutton family and the Davies family and others who may be going through times of loss and difficulty, we pray for your comfort and your peace and your strength. God, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, last weekend, um, Cindy and I celebrated our 11th uh, wedding anniversary with a trip up to the Central Coast. Um, and 11 years ago, when we got married um, in a Glendora friend's backyard, um, we blended our two families together. And so me with my four sons and Cindy with her three sons and son daughters and two daughters became something new. Um, we became um, a family. And back then, um, we didn't have a dining room table big enough for everyone. Um, and so we had to put two folding tables um, uh, next to each other in order to make room for everybody. And we started our search for our very first family furniture purchase, a table big enough for everybody in our family. And it took us about a year and a half to finally find it, but we finally found a, a long cherry wood table that comfortably seated 12. Um, and that table over the years has become a symbol of our family, our blended family. Well, today we start our new series in the season of Epiphany called Welcome to the Table. See, having a seat at a table means that you belong. And for the next seven weeks, for the uh, season called Epiphany in the Christian calendar, we're going to explore the theme of hospitality from the book of Luke in the Bible. And by hospitality, I'm not talking about um, having friends over for dinner or having perfect table settings. I'm talking about a way of life, a hospitable way of living, about living a life of invitation and being a community of hospitality. And so today, as we start our series, we're going to see how Jesus was received as a guest in his hometown of Nazareth. And so if you're willing and able, would you stand for the reading of God's Word out of Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. This is the Word of the Lord for us today. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what, you, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, Jesus continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. 
Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and drove Jesus out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But Jesus walked right through the crowd and went on his way. You can be seated. This event takes place early on in Jesus' ministry. As Jesus is teaching about God's kingdom and performing miracles throughout the region of Galilee, he comes to his hometown, which is in the region of Galilee, his hometown of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a small rural village with a population probably of less than 500 people. It was the boonies of Galilee. It was the backwater of Galilee, not known for much of anything. In fact, once when someone found out Jesus was from Nazareth, they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yet Nazareth is where Jesus grew up, along with his siblings, alongside his mother Mary, his presumed father Joseph, who was the local carpenter. And now as an adult, Jesus, with a growing reputation of being a teacher and a miracle worker comes to his hometown for a visit. And during his visit, Jesus worships at his home synagogue, the synagogue he grew up attending as a child. Now, in a community, the people who went to the synagogue were the people in that community who took their faith the most seriously. These were the devout, the faithful, We might say the good church-going people of the community. And during the worship service in the synagogue, a leader hands Jesus a scroll from the book of Isaiah. Now, they'd probably invited Jesus to do this reading from Isaiah before the service started as a way of honoring him and celebrating his homecoming at his hometown. And so Jesus takes the scroll, and he reads from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. We don't know whether Jesus chose this passage himself or whether they were following a predetermined reading schedule, like a lectionary of some kind. But regardless, he reads from Isaiah 61, which begins with the words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. We don't use the word anointed very much these days. But in the ancient world, leaders were often set apart for their leadership role by sprinkling oil on them, and this was called an anointing. The anointing with oil of a leader symbolized the anointing by God on that leader for their leadership role. In fact, the word Messiah means anointed one. The promised one who would be anointed by God himself to bring deliverance and salvation to the world. So Isaiah 61 is about the promised Messiah. And as Jesus reads these words, written over 700 years before Jesus was born, he takes these words as describing himself. In Brendan Burns' book on hospitality in the book of Luke, Burns says it's hard to overstress the importance of this scene in Luke's gospel. Burns goes on to say that in modern political terms, this is where Jesus launches his campaign. These words from Isaiah 61 have been called his manifesto, his messianic mission statement. He sees himself as anointed by God to proclaim good news to the poor, release for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed. And when Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus, 
Israel was in exile in Babylon. And in Isaiah's day, these were talking about literal conditions, literal blindness, literal poverty, literal imprisonment. And as the Messiah, Jesus came and he did feed the poor. He released captives. He healed the blind and restored their sight. But these words are also describing spiritual conditions as well. And as the Messiah, he would bring hope to the poor in spirit, liberation for those enslaved by sin, and spiritual sight to those who were spiritually blind and in darkness. Still reading from Isaiah 61, Jesus announces that the year of the Lord's favor has arrived. This is a reference to the Old Testament year of Jubilee. The Old Testament law stipulated in the book of Leviticus that every 50 years in Israel, all debts were to be forgiven and all land was to revert back to the land's ancestral owners. This was called the year of Jubilee, every 50 years. Now, according to Bible scholar N.T. Wright, there's no evidence that Israel ever actually observed the year of Jubilee but it was commanded every 50 years. Jesus then rolls up the scroll and sits down. And there's this awkward silence in the synagogue as everyone is staring at him. Now, part of the reason they're staring at Jesus is because they expect him to say something. It was customary in synagogue worship for the invited scripture reader to comment on the passage that they had just read. So they're waiting for Jesus to say something about this passage. But they're also staring at Jesus because Jesus actually stops short in his reading of Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. See, Isaiah 61, verse 2 includes a phrase that Jesus omits. Verse 2 says that this anointed one, when he comes, will also be anointed by God to bring the day of God's vengeance on all of Israel's enemies. You see, this passage ends with judgment, but Jesus leaves that part out. And so as they stare at Jesus awkwardly, waiting for him to say something, wondering why he didn't finish the scripture reading for the day, He finally says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not some distant future. Today, Jesus is that anointed one. How will the good church-going people of his hometown respond to that? Well, at first, they speak well of their native son, at first. But verse 22 also says they were amazed at his gracious words. Now, that may sound like a compliment to us, but I don't think it was. Remember, Isaiah 61, verse 2, ends with words of judgment, condemning words, not gracious words. They were amazed because Jesus read the gracious words and left out the condemning words. Reformed theologian G.K. Burkhauer says that their amazement was a criticism of Jesus, not a compliment of Jesus, which is why they turn to each other and say, isn't this Joseph's son? And that's when Jesus starts pushing them. You see, Jesus knows the people of his hometown have heard all about the miracles he's been performing in the nearby city of Capernaum. And he also knows that his hometown is expecting him to perform those same miracles there. They feel entitled to those miracles. If anyone should have the inside track to this miracle worker, Jesus, it's his own people from his own hometown. But instead, Jesus compares himself as a prophet without honor. 
He compares himself to Elijah and Elijah, two ancient Hebrew prophets from the Old Testament. In 1 Kings chapter 17 in the Bible, Elijah provided life-giving support and food for a Lebanese widow during a famine. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, the prophet Elisha healed a Syrian soldier of leprosy. These two stories from the Old Testament for Jesus explain why he won't be doing any miracles in his hometown of Nazareth. And this infuriates his people. The godly, church-going faithful who've known Jesus and his family all these years drive their native son out of the synagogue, out of town, and try to throw him off a cliff. And as it turns out, the only miracle Jesus performs in his hometown is the miracle of escaping their rage and intended violence as he walks right through it. Now, this story sets the tone for everything else that's coming in the book of Luke. Brendan Byrne, in that book on hospitality, talks about a triangle of hospitality in Luke's gospel. And in this story, we find Jesus at one point in the triangle. Jesus is both the guest and the host on this triangle. He is a guest in Nazareth. The native son who's finally come home after making a name for himself and being successful. But he's also the host in the story because he's the one anointed by God to invite people into God's kingdom, into God's table, God's hospitality. The second point of the triangle are the people of the synagogue, Jesus' own people. And at first, they roll out the red carpet, welcoming Jesus with open arms. They honor him by inviting him to read from Scripture in their worship service. They speak well of him. But the third point of the triangle, are the people that Jesus is also anointed to invite to the table. The poor, the imprisoned, the blind, the oppressed. People like a Lebanese widow, Elijah cared for, and a Syrian soldier, Elisha healed. Jesus invites both the the good, church-going, faithful of Nazareth to the table and people who would never set foot in a Nazarene synagogue. He invites to the table as well. But the people of Nazareth don't want to sit at a table with the poor and the imprisoned and the blind. And they certainly don't want to share a place at the table with a Lebanese widow or with Syrian soldiers. And so their hospitality turns to hostility as they reject Jesus because of who Jesus welcomes. So as we begin this series, what do we learn about hospitality from this story? I think we learn at least three truths. Here's the first one. The arrival of Jesus is an invitation into God's hospitality. The arrival of Jesus is an invitation to the hospitality of God. When when Jesus came into our world, something radically changed. Most often, Jesus described this change as the kingdom of God has arrived. Here, Jesus calls it the year, the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. I think it's talking about the same thing. You see, if the season of Advent represents waiting for the Messiah's arrival. And the season of Christmas that just ended represents celebrating the Messiah's arrival. The season of Epiphany, the next seven weeks, represents deciding how we will respond to that arrival. And so Jesus presses the people of his hometown to decide, will they trust him? the local carpenter's son? Will they decide to take a seat at the table of God's hospitality? And we have to decide as well. In C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, 
Lewis famously wrote that when we're confronted with Jesus and his claim to be the Messiah, we really only have three options to choose from. We can dismiss Jesus as crazy, someone who wrongfully thinks he's the Messiah, someone who's deluded himself. In that case, Jesus would deserve our pity. Or we can write Jesus off as a liar, someone who claims to be the Messiah, but who knows he's not really, and that would make Jesus a charlatan. Or he really is. And we can accept his claim as true and become his follower. The arrival of Jesus is an invitation to the table of God's hospitality, but each of us must decide whether we will take a seat at that table. The second truth we find in this story is this story shows us that God's hospitality extends to everyone. It extends to everyone. See, back then, most Jewish people believed that when their Messiah finally arrived, he would separate people into two groups. He would separate the godly from the ungodly, the righteous from the unrighteous, the good from the bad. People back then believed that the arrival of the Messiah would bring grace for some people and judgment and condemnation for others. Yes, good news for the poor and release for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, but also the day of God's vengeance. But Jesus doesn't see his mission that same way. If the year of the Lord's favor has arrived, if the kingdom of God has arrived, it's a time for grace, not a time for judgment. And that's why I think Jesus abruptly stops short in his reading and omits Isaiah 61, verse 2. And it's not because Jesus didn't believe there was going to be a future judgment. He does. He talks about a future judgment a lot throughout his earthly life. But now is not the time for it. His first arrival is a time of grace. As John 3.17 puts it, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The arrival of Jesus meant God's grace has arrived and God's judgment has been delayed to a future time. We like to look at the world as if it were a Hollywood Western sometimes. We like to divide the world into heroes and villains, good guys and bad guys. And we draw a clearly defined line between the good guys and the bad guys, between the heroes and the villains. Whether it's the Republicans and the Democrats, or between citizens and immigrants, or between racial groups or different nations. This is a view of our world that's sold to us in many movies and over cable TV and that we see represented in a lot of social media. But that is not the biblical view of our world. I'm reminded of the words of a famous Russian novelist named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn was a committed follower of Jesus who spent several years in a Soviet prison camp for criticizing Joseph Stalin and his communist government. And if anyone had reason to divide the world into heroes and villains, good guys and bad guys, it was him. And yet Solzhenitsyn wrote, the line separating good and evil passes not through states or classes or political parties or groups, but in every human heart. That is the biblical view. Every human being, without exception, was created in God's image, brimming with potential for goodness and beauty and love. And yet also, every human being, without exception, is lost in sin, spiritually dead, apart from God's grace, and therefore brimming with potential for evil, hatred, self-deception, and destruction. The line separating good from evil runs through every human heart, including my heart, including your heart. And this is why Jesus offers God's hospitality to everyone. 
Because everyone is lost apart from grace. We are all the poor who need to hear the good news. We are all prisoners who need release. We are all blind that need our sight restored. We are all the oppressed that need to be set free. The problem isn't with them, whoever they are. The problem is with me and what's in my heart. The most devout, faithful, church-going people in Nazareth nearly murdered Jesus. What makes us think we are any different than they are? God's hospitality is for everyone because everyone needs it. Finally, and third, rejecting God's invited guests is a rejection of God. Rejecting God's invited guests is a rejection of God himself. If we want to find our seat at the table of God's hospitality, it means sharing that table with the other guests that he has invited. I don't get my own private table with Jesus or just he and I. And some of those other guests might be people who are hard for us to sit next to. Several years ago, my mom invited a homeless man she had met at church to join our family Thanksgiving meal. And one of my sons, he was a sophomore in high school at the time, was really upset about it because it made him so uncomfortable sitting at the table with someone so different. But that experience was a formative moment for him to understand God's hospitality. Who would it be hard for you to sit at a table and share a meal with? Maybe someone who votes differently than you or sees the world differently from another country or someone who's been incarcerated or goes to a different church. And let's be honest, there are probably people who wouldn't want to sit at the table next to you or next to me. But there's no predicting who will end up at the table of God's hospitality. This is something the early church had to learn the hard way. See, there's probably no greater image of this image of us sharing a table in hospitality than communion, the Lord's Supper, where we take the bread and the cup together. And according to the Bible, the church in the city of Corinth in Greece had real problems with this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we learn that when the church in Corinth came together to celebrate the sacrament of communion, the Lord's Supper, some of the wealthier members were uncomfortable sharing the table with the poor. And some of the educated and cultured members were uncomfortable and didn't like sharing a seat at the table with the uneducated and unsophisticated. So these wealthy, cultured Christians in Corinth decided to create their own worship time with their own celebration of communion just for them. And some of Paul's harshest words in all of his letters are directed to that group. In 1 Corinthians 11.22, Paul says that these separate gatherings are showing contempt for Jesus' church. In chapter 11, verse 27, he says that by excluding the poor from the table, they were sinning against the body and blood of Jesus. And then finally, he concludes in verse 30 of that chapter, He says, this is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Wow. Rejecting God's guests is a rejection of God himself. So the arrival of Jesus marks the arrival of God's hospitality into our world. And this arrival brought grace, the Lord's favor, a grace that's offered to everyone. God's judgment is real, but it has been deferred, postponed to his second coming. And now we live in a season of invitation. It was a radical message back then, and it's still a radical message today. So what does that mean for us here at Glencurve? 
After all, part of our mission statement, we see it on the wall every week over here on your right, is invite. Part of our mission statement is inviting everyone to join in the journey, not just certain people, inviting everyone. I believe this is a time for us to grow in making the table bigger. In Henry Nowen's book, Reaching Out, Nowen says that church is one of the few places left in our society today where we can meet people who are different than we are and become like a family with each other. Let's make our table bigger with room for all who would come who aren't yet at the table with us. This is my prayer for us over these next seven weeks of the season of Epiphany, that we not only take our seat at the table, but we would invite and welcome others to the table as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. And Lord, we in this story tend to identify with the poor and the blind and the oppressed and the prisoners. But Lord, too often we're like the good, faithful people of Nazareth. Lord, we confess that before you as sin. Lord, we want to welcome who you welcome. We want to take our place at the table and make room for all who you would bring. So, Father, as we begin this series, as we begin this new year, may we grow in our hospitality. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.